Please, my computer's not working at the moment, but this is what happens. Uh, taking on the uh, attitude of "cela pandemie," it's uh, it's the pandemic, and just uh, things often don't work, and we have to figure things out along the way. And so, I imagine this is the spirit of the uh, teaching today: uh, how to figure out uh, ways by which we can respond to a a global uh, pandemic that uh, is very much a mirror for all the problems that are going on, uh, not only around the world, but uh, certainly uh, here uh, in, in the United States, um, uh, pandemics acting as a mirror in which we're seeing uh, many of the uh, faults and failures of a, of a system organized around uh, getting the rich richer uh, at the expense of everybody else, and uh, even to the point of are uh, willing to uh, shovel in uh, uh, into the mall of mall of industry uh, working people so that uh, those who uh, continue to make profit are able to continue to do so. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that's going to be uh, further along in the teaching. I'm just going to talk uh, about the origins of um, uh, SARS-2, that the uh, virus that causes COVID-19. Um, big picture, coronavirus is a broader term, and uh, all of us have had a, a kind of coronavirus. We've had the alpha coronaviruses, uh, they call the kind of uh, some of the uh, worst common colds that uh, circulate. But it's the beta coronaviruses are the ones that are uh, got people's attention. Started in, in 2002 when SARS 1 emerged out of bats and civets in uh, China, spilled over, and went on to. Uh, infect uh, several thousand people around the world, largely in, uh, in China and Hong Kong, but also uh, uh, Toronto comes to mind. Uh, and by dint of the fact that uh, uh, people were infectious only upon presenting symptoms, um, even though we did not have a vaccine or uh, antiviral specific to SARS-1, we could isolate people as soon as they call symptoms, show symptoms and to be able to stop uh, the virus from spreading that way. Um, in 2012, we had MERS uh, emerge, also a kind of SARS-like coronavirus, uh, emerged out of Saudi Arabia and uh, Jordan, out of uh, industrialized camel. Um, but it's the SARS-2, of course, is the one that is presently driving the, the uh, uh, pandemic. And it was first detected in Wuhan, and uh, of course, the great shock of it is that uh, how infectious it's been, but in addition, uh, people can be infected uh, from those who do not display symptoms, and uh, that's probably in part uh, some of its, uh, it's the great secret by which it's been able to spread around the world. Um, well, we were able to detect it, uh, first detect it uh, apparently out of the uh, wet market in Wuhan at yes, the uh, end of the December. That was the well. initial focus. Um, the rea yes. reality is uh, apparently becoming a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, we have uh, source back uh, coronaviruses are uh, smeared across central China. And uh, this SARS uh, probably uh, emerged from uh, bats before spilling into an intermediate species in all likelihood, uh, given the genetics of the, of the virus. It appears to be a combination of a, a bat uh, virus uh, along with one that had circulated among pangolin. Pangolin are a mammal, a kind of anteater-like thing. Uh, uh, so the genetics of the virus shows uh, recombinant that subsequently spilled into humans. Uh, now all this is, uh, a lot of these pathogens, particularly as they circulate, uh, often have a very broad geographic palette or a range. Uh, so it's unlikely to have emerged uh, first out of that market in Wuhan. I know there's a lot of focus on whether or not it came out of lab. I don't think that's the case. Uh, the genetics are such that it speaks to, in all likelihood, a, a true event. Uh, these things are natural, and we'll speak more about that in a second. Uh, but the, um, the genetics are speak some sort of recombinant of the bat and pangolin. And uh, some of the uh, biogeography, that's a kind of discipline dedicated to using genetics of, uh, of a virus 
uh, uh, animals involved, in not just wild food, but uh, uh, traditional medicine. Uh, so th that seems to be the geographic range that we're operating uh, or looking at in terms of uh, its origins. So, um, uh, so what we have here is, is that uh, a very wide uh, range indicates that there is a, a process by which um, animals are being transferred from uh, the, the deepest forest uh, and the pathogens that are uh, circulating among them. Uh, making their way uh, along uh, the circuits of production, uh, whether wild food or uh, other illegal trade, uh, and then making their way to the uh, uh, regional capitals and then on to the international travel network. Now, uh, our group, uh, has, we've been looking at this for um, uh, since 2005, for me personally, uh, but a lot of attention has been dedicated to and the new infectious diseases uh, coming out of uh, starting in 1997 with H5N1, that's the avian influenza, the kind of first celebrity uh, virus uh, that to emerge uh, in the new uh, century. Uh, and then, of course, we had a whole series of uh, pathogens that emerged, uh, a lot of it for the influenza. Uh, H1N1, swine flu 2009 comes to mind, but there was also H7N9. Uh, that we have uh, H5NX that was uh, emerged out of uh, Europe. We have, uh, of course, the swine flu H1N1, if you remember, uh, emerged uh, out in uh, hog farms outside of Mexico uh, from uh, pathogens that have been circulating in North America, primarily the United States, Canada, and also uh, in uh, Eurasia. Uh, so, in other words, what I'm getting at here, it's not all about China. Um, we have uh, apparent shifts in the way um, um, food is being produced in such a way around the world that is apparently selecting for the emergence and spread of, of new pathogens. But to complete the list for now, um, we had uh, MERS and SARS that we talked about. Um, we had uh, Ebola, we had Zika. And so these, uh, every time a, a new pathogen emerges, the head sends us running to the internet to uh, look up the, all the specifics of the virus as we should, you know, what virus, Virus uh, taxon is it from? Was it what's its uh, pathogenesis? What's its uh, epidemiology? What's its clinical course? Uh, are there any uh, antivirals or vaccines available? Uh, how do we go about uh, uh, controlling the spread? Um, what is the likelihood of it uh, catching fire, as it were, and moving from some sort of proto pandemic regional outbreak to something more serious that gets uh, around the world? Uh, uh, and is it deadly? Is it just uh, does it just kill some people over uh, some demographics over others? So we get so involved in specifics as we should that uh, uh, it's our group's under, uh, feeling about it is that we, as we can't seem to lose out on what actually ropes uh, many of these pathogens together. And uh, in my description of how um, uh, I began to talk a little bit about these kind of circuits of production and in and, and our view. view we have um, a, a foundational shift in how uh, pathogens are emerging uh, in such a way that those that were previously marginalized in uh, wildlife species are suddenly are, are sprung out of uh, their forest areas and are able to uh, make their way toward that international travel network. And uh, our, our vision of it comes uh, from the, an under, greater understanding that circuits of capital globally are uh, penetrating into the last of the deeper forest, uh, turning uh, the last of the virgin farmland over uh, to multinationals uh, or uh, local corporations that are, are interested in turning uh, that last of the forest to things like mining and logging and intensive agriculture, um, uh, and to, in essence, clear out smallholders and the indigenous. Uh, and so we have a foundational almost final confrontation between the global north and the global south over the last uh, bit of uh, uh, virgin farmland uh, that can be made out of uh, the dwindling forest. And uh, for the most part, a lot of the um, uh, host species uh, for these pathogens, many might die out uh, by virtue of the loss of the land, but some species actually do quite well in the face of, uh, of that. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, what comes to mind are the uh, 
uh, geese here in North America when they're um, uh, they're uh, wetlands uh, that they wintered over you know, along the Gulf of Mexico was turned into shopping malls. They did just roll over and die. They looked to all the grain that we were growing up as far north as Minnesota, changed their behavior, and began to uh, winter down uh, all the, along the farms up to Minnesota. And so their populations actually exploded in size in such a way that they went when they went to summer up on Hudson Bay and um, they would uh, sow to spoil the, the tundra and rip out the sedge to the point to leave uh, the landscape as a, a mud pit. Well, in, in Africa and in, in, in uh, other areas, uh, China comes to mind again. Uh, the bats, who are a reservoir for Ebola viruses and coronaviruses, uh, are also behaviorally plastic in responding to uh, the infiltration of, uh, of capital. Uh, in such a way that um, they are now gravitating toward the uh, uh, commodity uh, plantations. So, um, uh, so they are not, in essence, uh, they are able to come to these plantations. Uh, palm oil comes to mind, and you have a, a lot of, uh, you know, you don't have predators there. You don't have com competition there. You have a nice space between the, the rows of trees so that you can, freely fly between your roosting sites and your foraging sites. Uh, and you also increase the interface with the humans. That's not the objective, but that's a kind of emergent property of that in such a way that well, previously marginalized pathogens are spilling over at a greater rate and in, in a greater diversity. And so Ebola is an example of a spillover at that kind of wild end of that circuit of production, where it'll spill over into uh, local indigenous groups into laborers on the plantation, and many laborers are engaged in what's called cycle migration. So they have uh, work in regional capitals and come back down to help family with the, uh, the harvest. And so a uh, pathogen that spills over can make its way to a regional capital in, in such a way that Ebola's uh, previously would spill over and take out a village or two or a guerrilla troop, a terrible thing. You have um, case fatality ratios as high as 90%. Uh, but then in 2013, uh, the, these Ebola's, which are not in that different at all in terms of its genetics or clinical course or epidemiology, all of a sudden infects 35,000 people, killing 11,000, leaving bodies in the streets of regional capitals. And so what is the shift here? I mean, it's not on the virus itself. Uh, there's such a, an impulse, uh, even among epidemiologists, to focus on the object involved instead of uh, seeing how uh, causality can extend out into the greater field. Our group uh, put a book out uh, titled Neoliberal Ebola, because we saw that the shift in uh, the political economy of the area, the, uh, the uh, neoliberalism has imposed itself uh, upon the landscape uh, in such a way that on the supply end, as it were, uh, in terms of the virus, a lot of uh, uh, the countries in West Africa are forced to open up their uh, landscapes to multinationals for logging, for mining, for intensive agriculture. So it's the spillover increases that end. Much work has been uh, written up on the other end of it, of the, what I'm calling supply, uh, the demand end, in, in, in a sense. Of course, nobody's demanding it, but structurally speaking, uh, structural adjustment programs, uh, 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 caused um, uh, governments to uh, put out lesser uh, budgetary outlays toward things like public health and animal health uh, in such a way that if someone should get sick, they end up in a local clinic. The clinic doesn't have the resources enough to identify an Ebola outbreak or uh, Ebola case. And so uh, the human-to-human the -human infections are allowed to uh, 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 cluster and spread out and um, and make their way to, to the capital. So that, that's an example at one end. Uh, the other end of the circuit production, uh, you know, have diseases like avian influenza, swine influenza that uh, emerge typically on uh, industrial uh, 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 husbandry, uh, industrial farms like hog and uh, poultry that are closer toward the city areas. So uh, here in Minnesota, uh, southeastern Minnesota, you had uh, an outbreak of H5N2 among um, uh, industrial Turkey and, uh, in, and uh, layers uh, in uh, southern Minnesota and northern Iowa. 
uh, with our stone's throw uh, from uh, some major cities. Now, uh, thankfully, it didn't go human to human, but it's an example of, of uh, pathogens uh, emerging out more on that and on that end of it. But some of the uh, the, the things like the the SARS uh, and Zika are examples in which they're using the entirety of that circuit to um, uh, undergo the shifts necessary to go human to human. I'm speaking anthropomorphically because it's kind of hard to talk about this. It's not obviously an, an evil intent on the virus, but it's just an emergent property of, of the virus's uh, starting attributes. And then as it's confronted by the opportunities that um, shifts in our agri-economics present it, it takes advantage of them. Uh, so, uh, as began the, the talk here, and I'm going to wrap up uh, in a couple minutes to, uh, so we can move forward, but as a way of laying the, the, the context here, uh, the uh, SARS-2, uh, as I explained, in all likelihood emerged uh, in some combination of uh, uh, infiltration upon bat land that led to the increase in uh, rates of spillover of these coronaviruses that have been documented to be widespread across central China. Uh, then subsequently pinged back and forth across uh, multiple hosts. There's examples of uh, in a hog uh, being infected by SARS-like uh, uh, diseases, um, but also in uh, some of the uh, uh, wild foods um, species like civets and, um, and in this case the pangolin. Uh, now the thing is, it's really uh, you know we are presented with a series of false dichotomies here. Uh, often we uh, separate out industrial uh, livestock from wildlife animals, but uh, increasingly that distinction is becoming mushy. A lot of uh, wild foods, uh, not just in China but worldwide. Are increasingly being uh, industrialized. So civets and alligators and all sorts of uh, species that we would never imagine to be uh, farmed are actually increasingly farmed for uh, food and other purposes. And so uh, uh, the money bags backing industrial ag are also starting to uh, uh, back uh, uh, more of these kind of industrialized wild, increasingly industrialized wild foods. There's also a competition for land. So as in, uh, industrial ag uh, makes its way, pushing itself toward the last of the forest, it forces the wild food sector to try to uh, uh, push farther into the forest to find uh, its source uh, animals. And so in other words, uh, industrial and wild food sectors share a, um, an economic geography. Um, so uh, this is the way that we've come to arrive at how uh, many of these uh, pathogens are increasingly spilling over into humans. And as we know, uh, the uh, global travel network is as integrated as it's ever been. So any pathogen that might emerge out of uh, a forest that was in the bat uh, six months ago uh, is now uh, hitting uh, uh, you know, it's circulating in the lungs of many of New York and American and uh, uh, people around the world as they uh, lay out on their couch uh, or in their beds uh, trying to catch their breath. So there, that, that's uh, what I have to, to offer today. Okay, well, thank you very much, Rob. Um, there, we will find there are many ways that the financial and system is laid the groundwork for this virus. Um, so look, there are now 50 people. So don't unmute yourself. Please do raise your hand so we keep the noise level low. But we're going to have 10 minutes for discussion and go on to the next speaker. But I do also want to remind people that uh, there will be a full hour for discussion at the end of the presentations. Um, I'm not sure that Rob can stay on, but um, some of us will definitely be here. Okay, uh, John. So uh, I actually have a whole series of questions here. Um, first of all, is it true, I had the impression up until now that um, this virus or this zoonotic disease differs from some of the others in that 
it did not emerge through factory farming. Um, but I'm getting the impression that you're saying that it may have. Is my understanding correct? That's my first question. Um, and in, uh, in, um, in relation to that, if I'm understanding you correctly, Rob, you seem to be saying now that it may not have jumped the species barrier in that Wuhan market. Am I, am I understanding you correctly about that? And finally, you commented on the domestic uh, uh, raising of formerly or of wild species. You, I think you mentioned civets and, uh, and alligators. Are they also now being raised on the factory farm model? So those are my questions. Yeah, well, you know, I, um, so much focus was on the, on the Wuhan market, and understandably so, because uh, clearly uh, that's where the virus uh, really took off in terms of our attention and understanding of it. Um, so, and, and justifiably so in the sense of we would imagine that a, such a SARS would emerge out of uh, such a market, given that SARS-1, for instance, uh, clearly came out of uh, some sort of spillover, uh, uh, in all likelihood, uh, from civets uh, sold in exactly that way. Uh, it might, uh, if, so these things tend to be a little bit more complicated. What comes to mind is uh, H5N1, the uh, avian influenza. If you look at its genetics, uh, it, you, they were able to, in essence, uh, recreate a, uh, a longer uh, chain of uh, the influenza uh, genome. It's a, very, it's a segmented one. And in essence, the different influenzas will trade their segments like card players on a Saturday night if they happen to infect a, a single animal or, or a human. And they were able to trace back the prov provenance, as it were, of each of these segments and discovered that the segments uh, emerged through a series of um, uh, host switching events um, uh, across uh, a wild waterfowl and uh, industrial um, uh, poultry before eventually clustering together in this, uh, uh, this constellation that we now recognize as the H5N1 that subsequently spilled over into Hong Kong in 1997 and alerted us that this outbreak had happened. So um, the question of um, you know uh, whether uh, Wuhan is the origins, uh, I think it now has to move back toward that kind of uh, view advantage of it, that it indeed it, it in all likelihood underwent a series of um, uh, host switch events and uh, recombination that led uh, eventually to this pathogen uh, uh, emerging. Uh, there's some work that indicated, as I said, that uh, some of the earliest, uh, uh, the, the, some of the um, uh, human um, um, SARS-2 cases that were uh, evolutionarily uh, most related to uh, the bat uh, sequence that seems to be uh, the most recent uh, common ancestor uh, were uh, uh, in essence, isolated in Guangdong, which is a province uh, much for uh, several provinces south of Wuhan. Um, and that, in essence, jives well with the, um, uh, the pangolin angle, given how much uh, pangolin traffic uh, merges out of uh, Myanmar through Yunnan all the way for the uh, provincial, uh, excuse me, the um, coastal provinces where uh, there's a, a large healthy trade in, in such animals. So I kind of broadened my scope um, uh, from Wuhan toward uh, earlier or farther afield dynamics that I think speak also, uh, I mean, certainly there aren't wild bats uh, flying through the streets of Wuhan, so we, that story has to extend out beyond uh, just the city itself. Um, in some sense, um, I think it almost doesn't matter. I mean, it does matter. We do want to know where this thing first emerged. But I think that we get so uh, focused on the object uh, and the event, you know, uh, of when this thing happened at the expense of the processes by which these uh, pathogens appear to uh, be emerging. And uh, uh, so I, I do think that, that large farms have, uh, have something to do with this. 
but I don't necessarily think that this virus itself specifically came off a large farm. And so what I'm asking people to do is to take a more relational vantage point of how different forces begin to impinge upon each other in a way that uh, ends up providing opportunities for pathogens uh, to emerge in a way that they hadn't before. So industrial ag has a big role to play in terms of cutting down into forests and turning primary landscape into the secondary uh, and, and tertiary kind of landscapes, uh, cutting down the forest, forcing um, uh, wild animals to either uh, die or adapt, and in essence, uh, disconnecting what were previously uh, ecological cascades and reconnecting them into new ecological cascades that allow pathogens opportunities they didn't have before. And that goes through the, throughout the history of uh, human uh, epidemiology. It uh, goes back uh, to uh, when we went from uh, wandering about to being uh, settled and uh, it began agriculture, pathogens uh, uh, were able to suddenly find their uh, uh, holes within human populations because uh, our increased spillover from our newly domesticated livestock, but in addition, uh, our concentration in towns allowed for the survival in human populations of more acute pathogens like influenza, like diphtheria. Uh, HIV's origins appear to be along this way as well. Uh, the phylogeography uh, basically um, marks the origins of uh, HIV to particular SIVs, the simian, simian immunodeficiency viruses, circulating among chimps in southeast uh, Cameroon um, at the turn of the 20th century about the time when the French and Germans had arrived and began to, in essence, uh, carve their uh, colonial path into the forest, and SIVs probably had spilled over for hundreds of thousand years into locals. But when you cut into the forest, you get uh, engaged in uh, rubber tapping and logging, and in essence engage uh, whole uh, gangs of workers to, uh, in essence, turning uh, subsistence bushmeat into um, a much more industrial scale of uh, 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 eating. Uh, that increases the interface again by which SIVs can spill over. And by virtue of being having this geographic uh, lifeline to the coast or down into the Congo, we see the, an SIV being able to, uh, in essence, hit the epidemiological jackpot, make its way down to the Congo and then the rest of the world. Uh, that may have happened over the course of several years. Um, in this case, uh, this may have happened um, in a matter of, uh, you know, this particular virus may have happened, uh, accumulated its um, recombinant mutations toward a human-to-human -human infection over the course of many, many months or, or even a, a, a year or two. Um, but it, it is that palette, uh, that geographic palette over which pathogens are suddenly uh, given opportunities they didn't have. Industrial ag is part of that. Sometimes industrial ag is foundationally at the point of um, contact by which a pathogen goes human to human. Other times, it's merely involved in the processes by which wild animals are moved about and then suddenly are given uh, exposure to, uh, in this case, in my view, wild foods that uh, led uh, eventually to a human to human. Now, it could have been that the SARS that was in uh, the hog that were identified a couple years ago in Guangdong as having a, a hog version of SARS, that could have gone human to human. It just happened not to have done that at that point. So in other words, these SARS are giving multiple modes of transmission and multiple opportunities by which it can increasingly interface with humans and then go human to human. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have time for just Two more questions, Carol and then Ganesh. I'm, well, first of all, I was wondering if there is a chat box, because there doesn't seem to be. But um, this, the more important question is, Rob, I had heard you speak at another one of these Zoom meetings, and you said that the United States, which I was, I didn't know, but not surprised, had invested heavily in the Wuhan markets and especially the stock market. 
So I was just wondering if you can go into that, especially with the United States, you know, attacking China to the extent that it is that it's now suing China and yeah. all of that, but it's completely complicit with all of this. Thanks. Absolutely. I mean, that's the whole thing. I mean, in the, in the course of being confronted with this notion, uh, in essence, it's as perhaps not surprising that the pandemic is now uh, fodder for the developing Cold War between China and the United States um, in the attempt to blame each other as a way of washing their hands of responsibility. But in essence, in my view, it's a type of pandemic theater by which to distract from the fact that in, in actuality, um, we have a, a situation where the United States and China and other uh, uh, heavily capitalized countries are involved in the very, uh, 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 are engaged in uh, collaborations, uh, uh, you know, interlocking uh, corporate directorates across countries that are engaged in the land grabbing that leads to the deforestation and uh, spillovers of these pathogens. And so, um, you know, we have to, I would argue, avoid the kind of uh, the, the, the flashing lights, uh, the, the show that's being presented here that allows us, uh, various camps to uh, glom on to, you know, what finger to point where when, in fact, uh, you have, uh, uh, in essence, a collaboration that went on that led to this. So, uh, you know, the, this, uh, what the examples I gave were that... Uh, uh, Goldman Sachs in New York City coming out of the housing crisis that it was able to glom on much of the uh, federal uh, bailout, and this sounds very familiar, right? It's just like the crust of the country is about helping rich people uh, and, uh, and corporations uh, through one crisis after another at the expense of everybody else. Well, coming out of the housing crisis uh, uh, intact, uh, uh, goal, uh, a crisis, by the way, by virtue of its uh, uh, derivatives and stuff it brought about, then Goldman Sachs got into diversifying its funding uh, finances in, in, uh, in ways that among them included uh, investing in a, uh, the finance arm of uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, Chinese uh, company that ended up buying uh, Smithfield, uh, the largest hog operation uh, uh, in, in the world, uh, Smithfield, the American company. Um, it also, Goldman Sachs also uh, bought uh, uh, a series of farms in uh, provinces south of uh, Wuhan um, that were both poultry and hog. So, you know, the point is, isn't that the, the, the farms that they directly bought were involved in the emergence of SARS? The point is, is that they, uh, this financing from one end of the world to the other, whether direct ownership or just, uh, 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 you know, investments, uh, you know, moves our, our, our eye off from the blame from one country to the other and to see that it's in essence a system, uh, circuits of capital that move from one side of the world to the other, impacting uh, uh, at the GPS coordinates by, at which uh, pathogens emerge. <coughs> um, so um, I would say this is what we've argued uh, several times that, uh, you know, uh, given that vision of it, then you have uh, cities like New York and London and Hong Kong are actually the worst disease hotspots. Because that's where the centers of capital that essence finance the deforestation and development around the world that leads to the uh, spillover of the pathogens in the first place. Okay, last question, Ganesh. Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, first, I want to thank Rob for a really insightful presentation. Um, it just, it, I mean, it, it points to me as to how much really we all need to learn up, about the ways in which. Yeah, I mean, I was just saying that uh, I wanted to thank Rob. And can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, just uh, can you hear me? Go, please. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm like in a sense that I, I'm just two things. I'm like, uh, um, first to thank you for amplifying a lot of the ecological dimensions of this current crisis. Um, and uh, secondly, thank you also for highlighting that it's uh, important not to focus so much upon origins. I mean, the quest for origins is, is often totally misplaced. 
there are, so, I mean, um, part of the ways in which this kind of a crisis has emerged uh, has a lot to do, for instance, uh, with China playing the role of a world factory for the last 30, 40 years. Um, and uh, a lot of, uh, you know, I mean, a, a lot of the global North has benefited enormously from this kind of uh, role played by China as a global factory. Um, uh, and all those supply chains and all those commodity chains that link China with the global economy um, are surely part of the explanation for the ways in which the virus has, uh, uh, you know, uh, played a role uh, in the in the current uh, pandemic. Um, so just that, yes, I, I mean, I, I mean, I'm totally against this entire climate of China bashing as well. I mean, I think it's a completely misplaced thing. And uh, I mean, thank you, Rob, for elaborating some of those implications. Sure, sure. You know, that's, that's uh, absolutely correct. I mean, that divide between global north and global south, the kind of uh, unequal ecological exchange going on that um, allows, uh, you know, 25 percent of the world's population to, in essence, use 75 or 80 percent of the world's resources. Uh, you know, it's uh, theft on, uh, on an unspeakable scale that, uh, uh, in essence, strips uh, much of the global south of its uh, not only its own resources, but uh, uh, in, in the course of destroying these forests, for that export economy uh, destroys uh, the ecological services that these uh, forests provide, if I may use the reductionist term there. Uh, I mean, uh, we're all very con cognizant of uh, uh, the, uh, the carbon overload, destruction of trees, that uh, the carbon sinks, uh, uh, but here's uh, an epidemiological equivalent of that. Uh, uh, forests are complex, very complex places, um, and uh, it's very hard for a pathogen to, to line up a whole series of hosts to uh, really go uh, uh, proto-pandemic and regionalized. Uh, uh, if you ever been in one of those forests, it's a very complex place, uh, a lot of uh, an ecolo you know, complex ecological networks, uh, in such a way that uh, makes a difficult thing for a pathogen to, to really blow out. And then that was my, out of my example of the Ebola, where it, it was hitting a, a village or two, but then goes uh, in, and infects 35,000 over, over three countries and, and risks, uh, it threatens to go uh, pandemic. Uh, then, I mean, think about how terrible things are now, I mean, with the, a virus that's uh, one to five percent um, of case fatality rate. I mean, if we were dealing with uh, Ebola that was at a low level of 30% case fatality rate that went human to human, uh, that would be a really a horrible, horrible thing. And, and that's the thing, you know, this is not a one-shot deal. We're not going to wait another 100 years to have another one of these pandemics. Uh, the way we set up, we keep uh, rolling the dice in such a way that um, uh, another one is already in play, is, is my guess. I mean, in fact, our group spent 2019 focused on a, a virus called African swine fever virus. It had emerged out of Africa it hit in the 50s and 60s, had hit some of the colonial uh, uh, metropoles in Europe. Uh, eventually, in the 2000s, made its way to um, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, a lot of industrial hogs there, but then came to uh, China in 2017, 2018, and killed uh, half their hog there. And uh, it's uh, like uh, a lot of the new pathogens. It's, that's a virus that can uh, spread by multiple modes of uh, transmission uh, in live hog and dead hog and cured meat after 15 years in out in the environment in sewage. I mean, that was something that uh, can keep you up at night. Uh, but then all of a sudden, uh, SARS-2 stepped on the stage and took the mic, right? Um, so that's the shock of it. It isn't just one after the other. They're uh, evolving and spreading in parallel at uh, this point, and uh, in such a way that um, uh, we are uh, in, in deep doo-doo, as it were, uh, on that account. Uh, but it's that foundational political economy that has to be corrected. Uh, we have to uh, engage in a better balance between global north and global south. Uh, that's uh, 
uh, and in essence, allowing uh, countries around the world to uh, use their resources. And if we are to trade, to do so on a, on a more even balance, uh, we have to, in essence, uh, end uh, capitalism as we know it, because that's, uh, in essence, uh, a system of social reproduction organized around sociopathy, uh, the notion that you can just burn through the entire resources of your planet uh, and ex as if it was uh, totally as if there were no limits involved and uh, as if there were uh, no consequences of the destruction that one, uh, many, many uh, capitalists have engaged in, but in multinational, in essence, just uh, externalize the worst of costs upon uh, the rest of the world. And uh, I would say very much so that uh, SARS-2 is one of those uh, externalized costs. And I think with uh, this kind of relational thinking that we've been discussing today, has to become front and center and has, if only by dint of the fact that uh, many New Yorker there uh, lying on its, uh, in his or her bed, car, uh, you know, uh, trying to catch their breath, uh, in essence, from a, a, a virus that began in a bat on the other side of the world uh, uh, maybe six months to a year ago is uh, so very much a shock to the system, you know, as our uh, Worlds become much smaller as we are, are self-quarantining. Self -quarantining. Uh, it's also become much bigger where, you know, uh, what's happening in our, our apartments as we uh, 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 try to recover from an infection had something to do with how capital was able to extend itself from one side of the, the world to the other. Okay, well, thank you.